Hello, and welcome back to the second part of section 1.3, where we're dealing with evaluating limits analytically. Now, if you recall from the first part, we were talking about what happens when we go to use direct substitution for solving limits, and it doesn't work. Specifically, if we get that 0 over 0 instance, which is called the indeterminate form. So one of the methods that we can use, uh, or two of them, I guess I should say, would be dividing out and rationalizing techniques. So example 7 is going to deal with the dividing out technique. And in this case, it says find the limit as x approaches a negative 3 of x squared plus x minus 6 divided by x plus 3. Now, if you go to do direct substitution, so I'm going to write ds over here. If I plug in a negative 3 and I square it, I'll get 9. I add a negative 3, I get 6. And then I subtract 6, that's going to give me 0. And if I go and I plug a negative 3 in for the denominator, I get negative 3 plus 3, which is also 0. So I end up with that indeterminate form, which means I have to do something else in order to solve this limit. This is not an acceptable answer. It just means it's going to take a couple more steps. So the first thing I usually like to look at is to see if you can divide something out. Is there a common factor between the numerator and denominator? So if we look at the limit as x approaches a negative 3, and we can factor our numerator into the quantity of x plus 3 times x minus 2, and we're going to divide that still by the x plus 3. And if you notice, I have a common factor in both the numerator and denominator that are going to cancel. So now we're left with the limit as x approaches a negative 3 of the quantity of x minus 2. And if I go ahead and do direct substitution, we end up with a negative 3 minus 2, which is going to give us a negative 5. So the limit as x approaches a negative 3 of x squared plus x minus 6 divided by the quantity of x plus 3 is really equal to a negative 5. And if we look at this problem graphically, you're going to see that the original function looks something like this. Okay, now I want to caution you on your calculator. Your calculator may not show this. Actually, most likely it will not show this as an undefined point unless you really zoom in. So you must know that because of this denominator here, that you have an undefined point at the coordinate point negative 3, negative 5. So now when we look at our limit, as we're coming in from the left and we're coming in from the right, we're still approaching that negative 5. So it does not change things when we factor out that common factor. Okay, and just as a refresher, because um, I know it's been since pre-calculus last year, that when you get to 0 divided by 0, this is called our indeterminate form. And we, it just tells us nothing more than the fact that we have to do something else in order to find the limit. Now let's look at example 8. It says to find the limit as x approaches 0 of the square root of x plus 1 minus 1 divided by x. Well, in this case, if I do direct substitution, I've got 0 plus 1, that's going to give me 1 under the radical, so the square root of 1 is 1, minus 1 is 0, and if I plug a 0 in for x, I get 0. So I have my indeterminate form. I can't really factor this, so in this case I'm going to have to rationalize my numerator, which is no different than when we are rationalizing the denominators of fractions that had radicals in them, except now I'm dealing with the numerator. So in order to rationalize, we're going, and let's just look at the function itself. So we have the square root of x plus 1 minus 1 divided by x. In order to rationalize, I'm going to multiply it by the square root of x plus 1 
minus, or I'm sorry, plus 1. So the only thing I changed was this operation symbol here. And it's just the opposite of this one. And then we're going to divide it by the same thing, which is the square root of x plus 1 plus 1 here. And essentially what I've done is I'm really just multiplying by 1, but I will be eliminating these radicals. So now when we simplify that, when you multiply these two things together, or terms, you end up with x plus 1. Because I have a plus here and a minus here, I know my middle terms are going to cancel, and then I'm going to be left with a negative 1 times a positive 1, which will give me a negative 1. And then in my denominator, I have x times the quantity of the square root of x plus 1, plus 1. And if we simplify, this one and this one will cancel out. So now we're left with x divided by x times the quantity of the square root plus 1, plus 1. I have a common factor again in my numerator and denominator, which is x and x. So this is going to give me 1 divided by the square root of x plus 1, plus 1, and I now have a simplified function. So let's go ahead and start out with our original problem. It said the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 divided by the square root of x plus 1 plus 1. And now if I do direct substitution and I plug that 0 in for x, I end up with 1 divided by the square root of 0 plus 1 is 1, plus 1 is 2. So I end up with 1 half. Again, if we look at this graphically, you'll see that your function looks like this. Make sure we know that at x equals 0, I have an undefined point. Okay, Otherwise, the rest of your graph is accurate on your calculator. Okay, and we'll see as we come in from the left and from the right, we are approaching that one-half mark. You may even go in and look at your table, and you'll see that as we're coming in from the left, our y values are getting closer and closer to one-half. Likewise, as we come in from the right, our y values are getting closer and closer to one-half. So this is, these are two additional ways that you can confirm that your limit was calculated correctly. And last but not least, we have the squeeze theorem. To give you an idea of what the squeeze theorem is, it's pretty much when you have a limit of a function that's essentially being squeezed or squished or falls between two other functions. So just like as a picture, if you look at this, you have a function which they call g here, a function that you call h here, and then the function that you're taking the limit of actually falls right in between those two functions. Now the actual squeeze theorem, which says the same thing, that when f falls in between h and g for all x in an open interval, then the limit as x approaches c of h of x is equal to l, which also equals the limit as x approaches c of g of x. So that tells us that the limit as x is approaching c of f of x, which is the function in the middle, must also equal l. Now you may in some textbooks see the squeeze theorem referenced um, as the sandwich or the pinching theorem. They're all the same thing. And from this we have two special trig limits. This is something that you will have to remember. Nothing more than the fact because if you go to do direct substitution, you're going to see that you get 0 over 0 here. Likewise, you're going to get 0 over 0 here. So you need to memorize or know that these are two special cases. So the limit as x approaches 0 of the sine x divided by x is equal to 1. And the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus the cosine of x divided by x is equal to 0. So our last example for today says to find the limit as 
x approaches 0 of the tangent of x divided by x. Now, kind of like some of the techniques that we were talking about last year in pre-calc, it might be more beneficial to rewrite tangent in terms of sine and cosine. So if we rewrite this, we have the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x divided by x times the cosine of x. So the sine over cosine is still your tangent, and then we have our x piece, which is right here. So if we rewrite this now, oops, we can go the limit as x approaches 0, and I'm going to break that up into the product of sine x divided by x and 1 divided by the cosine of x. Now if you notice, the reason I did that is because now I have a special property that we just discussed, which is the sine x divided by x, and I know that I can take the limit of that and have it come out to a nice numerical value. So essentially now, what we have is the sine, x the sine of x divided by x is really going to give us 1, and if I do direct substitution, the cosine of 0 is also 1, so I really end up with a limit of 1 times 1, which is 1. So the limit as x approaches 0 of tan x divided by x really equals 1. And now your fun fact today, which actually deals with frogs, says that frogs can see forwards, sideways, and upwards all at the same time. And they never close their eyes, even when they sleep. I thought that was kind of interesting. Hopefully you guys have a great day, and we will see you in class uh, tomorrow.